In Unit 15, we'll take a look at the formation of and the naming of what we call molecular compounds. Back in, chapter, in Unit 14, we looked at ionic compounds where we actually were transferring electrons back and forth trying to achieve an octet just like we have in the noble gases. In Chapter 15, we move that along a little further. <coughs> you might imagine a case where a couple of elements <coughs> both want to give up electrons and they can't seem to work that out, so they can go ahead and they form a, sort of a compromise. They do some sharing with that. So we'll be looking at those compounds in this section. Uh, <coughs> things we'll look at in particular, something we call Lewis structures for molecular compounds, similar to what we saw for ionic compounds. These told a little bit more interesting things about how things are actually bonded together, how atoms actually stick together. We'll look at some uh, things called polyatomic ions. We'll also look at how we name molecular types of compounds. You may find me slipping once in a while and using the word covalent instead of molecular. That's because I'm old. They used to be called covalent compounds all the time. Now they're more often called molecular compounds when we're sharing those electrons. So if we go back and think for just a minute, go back and recall your periodic table. And so if I go back and look at my periodic table, it looks like this. Uh, we have this stair step line coming right down over here. And that stair step line is going to tell me the separation between metals, remember that, and nonmetals over on this side. Our discussion on ionic compounds dealt with metals and nonmetals going together. That was a transfer of electrons we we're looking at. In reality, they don't transfer completely, but we like to think of it that way. And so we thought of that. And we now what we're going to look at is what happens now if we have nonmetals bonding with nonmetals. Fluorine and oxygen and fluorine and sulfur both want to pick up electrons to get their eight noble gas configuration. So it's certainly not going to be a case where sulfur looks at fluorine and says, here, I want your electrons. I want your electrons. And fluorine says, sure, take them because they're going to argue about it. And they, when they argue, contrary to very often happens, when they argue, they come out with some sort of a result for it. So let's take a look at how this thing works, how we can envision it, and see what happens with it. Uh, driving force again is similar to ionic compounds, uh, molecular compounds. The atoms don't form individual ions. They actually bond together to make things we call molecules. So we're going to look at how we draw Lewis structures to depict a little bit how these guys get stuck together. And then we'll also look at how we name these compounds. We won't look at how we write formulas for them because um, they can go together in lots of different ways. If you look at carbon combining with hydrogen and oxygen and nitrogen and sulfur and things like that, that's the basis of a whole branch of chemistry called organic. There are so many different compounds. We know 65 million different compounds, and most of them are going to be in that realm of carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, that kind of thing stuck together. So <coughs> let's think about this Lewis structure idea. The Lewis structure helps give us a little bit of an idea of how things bond together. It also gives us an idea down the road of what the shapes of molecules look like and what some of their properties will be. Key things to remember in drawing a Lewis structure, and this is very similar to ionic compounds, is the number of valence electrons drawn has to equal the total number of valence electrons in the atoms involved. We can't, we can't be getting stuff from elsewhere and drawing these things out. Secondly, the electrons are shared in such a way that each atom is effectively surrounded by eight electrons. It has this octet. You know, hydrogen takes two. There's some other exceptions we're not going to worry about. But, but they share the electrons, so each one looks out and says, oh, I've got my octet, and they're content, and the other guy next to him is content, too, because he thinks he has octet, his octet, and so it works out fairly well. And then uh, in a particular atom in a structure, all or some of the electrons in that at, around that atom may be shared with other, elect, shared with other atoms in the structure, <coughs> or they may be tied only to their atom they started with. So this is real wordy. Of course, you can watch this as fast or slow as you want to, so that's not a big deal. But this is sort of an approach for drawing Lewis structures. Basically, we draw a skeletal structure, put something in the middle that's sort of an oddball, uh, make sort of a symmetric structure, put something in the middle that has arms and legs on it. Carbon can take up to four bonds, nitrogen can take three, oxygen can take a couple. Those guys are good center atoms. Hydrogen can only take one bond. He can only hold two electrons at most. And so he's not a good center guy. He's got to be out at the sides. When we talk about a bond, a bond involves two electrons. Each bond involves two electrons. So let's take a look over here then. Let's, let's do it by example. <coughs> so here's, here's carbon tetrachloride. And the first step is to take and draw a structure for it. And CCL4 is what we're going for up here. So I draw a carbon in the middle because he's kind of the oddball. Chlorine, 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 and chlorine over here. And I'm going to take them and connect those atoms with what we call single bond. It's two electrons. Okay, so he's a single bond, has two electrons in them, and it looks something like that. 
<clears throat> but then the other thing I remember is I'm going for an octet in here. So I have to have eight electrons around each atom. So if I look at chlorines up here, chlorine here, chlorine here, chlorine here, what I've done is I've gone and I've populated the chlorine with what we call lone pair of non-bonded electrons, two here, two here, two here. So my chlorine now has two, four, six, and there are two electrons in that bond that makes for eight. So he has eight electrons. Everybody in the structure has eight electrons now. Carbon has two, four, six, eight. So I've satisfied all of my octets. The question I have to check on now is, did I really have that many electrons to work with? Because I notice I haven't counted them yet. So what I do is I go back into my periodic table and I say, well, okay, let's see where carbon is and where chlorine is. Okay, and carbon is over here. So in group 14, so he has four valence electrons. Chlorine is in group 17, so he has seven valence electrons. So when I come back to look at my structure, what I've got is one chlorine, four chlorines, 7H is 28, and I have four more valence electrons for carbon, that's 32. And if I look at my structure fairly carefully, <coughs> what I find out is I have 32 electrons. Remember, each line counts as two electrons. There's 32 electrons, that's my Lewis structure. You can have a structure like this. This is ammonia uh, and ammonia, NH3. I draw a skeleton with nitrogen in the middle. Again, hydrogen has to be around the outside. He has no choice. I bond my nitrogens to my hydrogens in here. Then I come into my nitrogen and say, okay, you need to have an octet. And so I take two, four, six electrons here in nitrogen already. Stick two here. Now he's got eight. He's got his octet. Is that the right number of electrons? Well, if we go back and look again, uh, nitrogen is in here. He's group 15, he has five valence electrons. Hydrogen's over here, has one valence electron. And so what I've got then is a total of eight, and there's my eight valence electrons. Everything's good. So nothing tricky about that. And you say, but certainly they must get harder. Well, they do, but we're not going to try to become experts at Lewis structure drawing. It's not a widely employable talent. Look now at something like this. This is SO2, sulfur dioxide. We'll see what we call him in just a minute. So what I do here is I draw my skeletal structure. Sulfur is good to put in the middle because he's an oddball. And he has you know, similar things on each end, looks nice and symmetric. I take and I connect the sulfur to the oxygens with a bond in each one. Remember, that's two electrons in there. And I come down here and I fill in the octets. So I put in two, four, six more around that oxygen. I put in four more around the sulfur. So he has eight, two. He has two, four, six, eight. And I put in eight more over here and I've got my octets. But again, I need to go back and check how many electrons I should have. Sulfur and oxygen, as it turns out, are both in group 16, or both have six valence electrons. So I go back into my structure again. I have two oxygens is 12. Two times six is 12, plus six more is 18. But if you count your electrons in here, I've got two, four, six, eight, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18, 20 electrons. I need 18. So the way I get rid of that in the scheme is say, well, I have to get rid of a pair of electrons, obviously. <coughs> but once I do, my octets will be shot. I won't have eight anymore. So what I do is this. I go in and I grab a lone pair of electrons. It doesn't matter which one. I grab a lone pair of electrons and throw it away. It wasn't really there to start with, so it doesn't matter. I just remember I drew dots. And so I throw one away, and then I slide a lone pair of electrons from an adjacent atom in to make a multiple bond. This is called a double bond because it's got two, it's got four electrons in it now, two lines coming across. And so now this structure has eight electrons on everybody. This oxygen has two, four, six, eight. He's got eight electrons. Sulfur has eight electrons. Oxygen has eight electrons. Okay, so this is a pretty simple process to do. This guy's called a double bond. If I had to do it again, I might end up forming a triple bond, three bonds. <coughs> in one place, but it's a fairly simple process to follow through as long as things don't get too big and ugly and things like that. So if we take a look at, let me show you one other example that I think would be possibly helpful. And that's this one that I have on the webcam up here. Let me go back to, uh, go back there. so what I have is SO3 two minus. We'll find out in just a minute, he's called a sulfite ion. But this guy, if I want to draw his Lewis structure, I put a sulfur in the center, oxygen's around the sides like that. I'm going to bond these together because they have to be held together like that. I'm going to fill in my octets like this. Fill my octets like that. 
And that looks really good, except I have to check and make sure I know how many electrons I have. Well, sulfur is still in group 6. It was in group 16, well, 16, it was group 16 a minute ago. It has six valence electrons. There's one sulfur. Gives me six. My oxygen is in group 6 also, but I've got three of those. So that's a total of 18. You see this two minus charge up here? What does that mean? If I've got two negative charges, what does that mean to me in terms of my electrons? I've got two extra valence electrons. So I have to add those in. My valence electrons, two of those, and I have a total of 26 electrons I should have in this structure. So I check my structure out. I've got 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18, 20, 22, 24, 26. That's my Lewis structure for that ion. What we'll do with the ions very often is draw a big bracket around it and then put up here that he has two minus charges on. <coughs> so people know that's actually an ion. Because you can have an SO3 that's not an ion, you have an SO3 which is an ion. And so it's it's a uh, it's a it's a mechanism for being able to draw these things uh, fairly well. Now, uh, this example I just gave you, SO3, is an example of what we call a polyatomic ion. It has poly means more than one basically. Atomic means atoms, and ion means you have a charge, and that's got all those traits to it. SO3 with two minuses has multiple atoms in it, and has a charge on it. Polyatomic ions there are whole groups of polyatomic ions that are pretty uh, well used, pretty well known. You're not going to have to memorize the whole list. The ones I would like you to be really familiar with are ammonium, hydroxide, nitrate, and sulfate, and phosphate that I have listed down here. I say be familiar with, be able to fill in the table it says the ammonium ion has this formula and this charge, hydroxide has this formula and this charge, and be able to work with those in terms of writing compounds. On the proctored test you're going to be taking, I'll give you a periodic table, the one I've been showing you, I'll give you that, but I'm not going to give you these polyatomic ions. Okay? Um, I'll expect you to know these, or I guess you can, uh, it's not cheating, but since I'm giving you a 3 by 5 inch index card, you can probably write them on there, but these five will be ones you'll work with fairly regularly. If I come up with another one, if I have a problem on a test, or I'm going to use a, uh, a sulfide ion or something like that, I'll tell you what that ion is, so you'll know that. All right, so here's a table of common ions, <coughs> just to scare the bejeebers out of you. But don't get too worried about it, because if you look at it pretty carefully, what you'll see up here is here's hydrogen, upper left, lithium, sodium, potassium, rubidium, and cesium all have plus ones. At this point, that should be no shock to you, because those guys, hydrogen, lithium, sodium, potassium, rubidium, cesium, are all group one. And we knew from the ionic compounds, group 1 takes a plus 1 charge. So if you look at that table and break it down a little bit, it tends to start to make a little bit of sense to you, which is sometimes a little scary. Here's magnesium, calcium, strontium, and barium in the group 2. Those are in the 2 plus box. Those are group 2. We know that. We know that's what they do. Here's aluminum at plus 3. Over here is fluorine, chlorine, bromine, iodine at minus 1. Notice the setup. These are all positive on the left side with charges of 1 plus, 2 plus, 3 plus. Negative on this side is charge 1 minus, 2 minus, 3 minus. Okay. And down here, oxygen and sulfur are both in group 16, and nitrogen and uh, phosphorus are both in group 15. I yeah, didn't mean to do that. <coughs> but these other ions are all around here, just informationally mostly at this point. So they're all in one place. I'll attach this to this slideshow in the Blackboard site, so you can actually pull it up if you want to and kind of keep a copy of it around just to be handy for you. You'll find the ones on here you have to know. You'll find the nitrates here, the sulfates here, the ammonium ions on here. The five are on there now that you're going to need to know and be, be comfortable with. So how hard is it writing formulas for naming compounds that have these polyatomic ions? Well, it's not too bad because <coughs> here's what you have to do. If, for example, I take sodium, which is in group one, has a plus one charge, and I combine it with the sulfate polyatomic ion, SO4 with two minuses, I can do the same crossover thing I did back for ionic compounds. This really is an ionic compound since it's made out of sodium ions and sulfate ions. Okay? And the sulfate ions are molecularly bonded to each other, but all together it's a stack of ions. So I take and I bring my 2 down here, and I bring my 1 plus down here, and that means my form is going to be Na2SO4, it's going to be called sodium sulfate. Now, sodium kept his name, and now the sulfate, this is the sulfate ion, he keeps his name as well. If I look at ammonium ion and sulfur, sulfur going together, again, crossover, two ammoniums, 
one sulfur. Notice when you put the two here, you need to put some parentheses to say that you're telling me there's two ammonium ions. You're not going to tell me it's NH42. It's not a nitrogen of 42 hydrogens. That nitrogen would be overwhelmed with that. And so we use the two to show there's two ammonium ions in there, and we call this guy ammonium sulfide. And then in here, barium and phosphate, the do the crossover thing again. And we do the crossover thing, what we'll find is that we get BA3 and then two phosphates. Again, the phosphates go inside a parentheses to show there's two of them, and it's just called barium phosphate. So you don't even have to change the name on this one to get it to work. In naming what we call binary molecular compounds, this is fairly simple too. It's binary just means there's two elements in it, two different elements in it. Uh, look at the list down here to see what I mean. Carbon, oxygen, carbon, oxygen, nitrogen, oxygen, nitrogen. There's two elements inside of it. The prefixes we use are from the Greek, mono, di, tri, tetra, penta, hexa, hepta, octa, nona, deca, things you've probably heard before. <coughs> and to name these, all we do is we just go straight at it and tell it, here's how many we have by using a prefix. So if I look at the first compound here, CO, I go to name that, you may know that as carbon monoxide. That's its standard name. Notice there's one oxygen, there's also one carbon. We didn't use monocarbon in front of it. By convention, what we do is we do not use the mono if it precedes the first element in the formula. So this one is just, it's not monocarbon monoxide, it's just carbon monoxide. This guy down here, carbon dioxide. You know, there's quite a difference between carbon dioxide and carbon monoxide. You exhale carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide is lethal to you. And so there's quite a big difference between those. Uh, go to name this guy, dinitrogen oxide, monoxide. This is laughing gas, dentist office, that's what it is, or sometimes called nitrous oxide. But the, the prefix thing is a much cleaner way of doing these types of things. Nitrogen dioxide, dinitrogen tetroxide, dinitrogen pentoxide. Okay, so it's <coughs> just using those prefixes. So over the last two units, we've done a lot of stuff. I've done a lot of stuff. but. Uh, we're talking about the ionic compounds and the molecular compounds and naming and all that sort of thing. This is my idea of a flow chart as far as how this goes together. And basically what you do is ask yourself the question, how many different elements do I have? In that comp not atoms, how many elements do I have? If I have two, it's one of those binary compounds. And so if it's a metal or a non-metal, we're in our ionic case. The one we saw in unit 14. <coughs> so groups one and two. Keep their name, aluminum, zinc, and silver. No modification necessary for those. Remember, aluminum, zinc, and silver are 3, 2, 1. And for the other metals, you put a Roman numeral with it to indicate the charge on each ion in the metal. For non-metal, you change the ending to IDE. Okay, so this is where our sodium chloride comes from, our barium nitride comes from, those types of things. If it's a non-metal, non-metal binary compound, then it's molecular, and we're going to use the prefixes, the di, tri, tetra, and that sort of thing. And if it looks like something has more than two, then it probably has a polyatomic ion in it, in which case the metal, if they have a metal part to it, it's just keep the name, same thing we have in this box over here. And then the polyatomic ions are going to retain their names, whatever their names were to start with. <coughs> if it's NO3 is a nitrate, it's always going to be nitrated naming these compounds. Uh, let's take a look at a little practice one on that while I have that flow chart up. And to do that, right here. Up top sheet, I've got a phosphorus. I've got three chlorines, phosphorus and chlorines. If you go back and think about your periodic table a little bit. Periodic table over here, phosphorus and the chlorines are, they're both nonmetals, aren't they? And so we have sort of a covalent, we have a molecular type of thing going together. Copper is a metal, nitrates, a polyatomic ion. Barium's a metal, phosphorus is a nonmetal. So my situations look kind of like uh, where to go? Right there. Oh. I got it. All right. So this is a non metal, non metal. So we're going to name this guy. He's binary. Up here, he's. Non-metal, non-metal, he's binary. We're going to use prefixes. We're going to call him phosphorus, tri, chloride. Okay? And you'll write better than I do when you do this. If I look at copper and nitrate group going to nitrate polyatomic ion, going to copper 
is a metal. And now, if you pay attention to this part, which I hope you will, you know, so when we talk about naming the metals in here, we say, okay, the metal keeps its name for groups one and two, aluminum, zinc, and silver. No modification is necessary. <coughs> for other metals, use a Roman maneuver to indicate the charge on each ion of the metal. So I look at this guy, and they go, okay, what's the charge on copper in here? Well, the nitrate is one of those you're going to get to know. The nitrate is an, is an ion that has a minus one charge. So if I have two of those in here, that's two minus charges, right? So what do you suppose that tells me about the charge in the copper? He's probably plus two. So I'm going to call him copper plus two, no, two in Roman numerals, nitrate. Looks like that. If I look at barium, I was going to name it for you. Look at barium and the phosphorus. That's another binary compound. It's a metal and a non-metal. So that's going to be ionic. The barium keeps its name because he's in group two. So it's going to be barium. And the phosphorus, okay, it's going to change its ending to IDE. So we'll call this barium phosphide. Okay, so it's just a very fairly straightforward routine you can use to uh, get that done. All right.